For some, this may seem like a joyful picture of me giving a child a toy. What you might not know is that moments after this photo was taken, the toy was forcibly removed from that girl. I should not have been there and this photo should never have been taken. Back to the channel guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I wanted to share this video that has been trending online for about two weeks. It's about this white British man that is exposing the truth behind mission charity trips in Africa. Personally, I, I don't know. I'm always 50-50 about these charity missions. I know that there are genuine sh charity missions out there, but I would say like 80% of those charity missions are never genuine. And I have a lot of ethical issues, especially around children. And now we know that you know child traf trafficking is at its peak. So they can be problematic. They have done a lot of bad things in my country, Kenya. So I don't know. I don't know where to go with this. I know that there are people who have benefited genuinely from charities, especially small charities. Don't even get me started on those big charities. We all know those ones. But I just want us to listen to this video, take what we can take, because I think I've learned so much about just, you know, just uh, listening to this young man share his, his experience on uh, the charity mission he did. Uh, this was done in South Africa. So again, just be aware. Before I continue, I'd like to take a moment to say that you should follow No White Saviors on Instagram. This organisation provides education and a lot of resources to help you understand exactly what the White Saviour Complex is and why it is so wrong and some of the harm that it does. So now it's time for me to talk about what I did and why I lied. The story starts in 2013. My brother had just got back from a World Challenge trip to Kenya and Tanzania and was telling my group at church. And one of the girls thought, why don't we do a trip like this? But... We could actually go out and help people. We could do an aid trip. And one of the leaders happened to have a connection with a charity based in South Africa who supposedly helped AIDS orphans. And he convinced us it was going to be this really good idea and that we could serve the world in the name of Jesus Christ and spread God's love and, and really help people. So we started organising events and attending events in order of our cause to try and raise money. And this is where the first problem occurred. We would say at the beginning of every presentation that there were 53 million AIDS orphans in sub-Saharan. One of the things that these charity organizations or these missions lie about is numbers. They actually manipulate numbers that the situation looks so desperate because as human beings, we don't like questioning things. As soon as we are told, oh, there are 50 million orphans in Kenya, and we just agree to it, we just embrace it, we just run with it, we don't question the numbers, we don't go look around looking at the numbers, we just run with it. So this is one of the ways that actually these um, charity organizations take advantage of all of us. I mean, if you have lived in the West, you know what happens there. They stop you on the streets, you're coming from work, you're coming out of a shopping mall, then you see these young kids you know, raising funds for these charity organizations on the streets they will stop you and tell you facts about africa most of the time those facts are not true again most of the time the facts are not true the numbers have been manipulated africa that number is incorrect i believe it's actually around 11 million and um, we've just been given like this information from the charity to read out when a couple of us found out although 11 million is still a massive number and it's still awful we were kind of just told to just brush it under the carpet it might not seem like a big problem, but it should have been a red flag. Cultural appropriation of a culture that doesn't even exist. We were made to run these events about all the horrible things going on, particularly in South Africa. And we had to sing a song at the beginning as a group called Adiamus by Carl Jenkins. People were led to believe this was a song in an African language. But in fact, Adiamus is not a language at all. It's just random sounds which happen to resemble Latin a bit. Third problem, donations. My mum disagreed with the idea that we should spend the money that was raised to pay for people's flights, food, accommodation. I absolutely agree with this part of the video because a lot of times you raise money for charities but then end up spending that money when you're on a charity mission. So imagine you're going on a charity mission, you have raised, I don't know, $10,000, 10,000 pounds, but then you end up uh, spending because that charity organization is actually paying for your trip. So they're paying for your accommodation, they're paying for your meals, they're paying for your transport, and they're paying for your visit to the community and everything else that you will do during that mission. So it actually beats the purpose, if you ask me. So this for me is a red flag. My dad wasn't employed at the time, but she said, you cannot go on the trip unless we are able to pay for 
all of your costs because this money should be going to charity. I don't think the money should be donated when you're talking about AIDS orphans and then be spent on flights. Other members of the church were disgusted by this because it made them look bad. But bear in mind we had two years to save up. So in the end, we managed to raise about 10 grand over two years. When it came to booking flights, we were booking our flights separately because we were paying ourselves. We found flights via Istanbul for £400, but the church adamantly flew direct just to cause any problems because some of the members didn't feel safe flying on Turkish Airlines who had fled British Airways. Instead of spending £400 each, it was £800 each, and that was coming up with the money for charity. Two, here's a picture of our group with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. This is me, I was really embarrassed to be there because we were forced to wear these t-shirts that said Africa on them, and had a massive picture of the African continent. We were going to South Africa, which is the country at the bottom here. But continuously youth leaders would say, we're going to Africa, and that's exactly what they said to Justin. And you know what? He looked horrified and he said back, yeah, but where in Africa? Because you know, it's a continent. And of course, I felt so awkward because I'd been telling them beforehand, we shouldn't, we need to just say we're going to South Africa. We need to get t-shirts that just have South Africa on, not the whole continent. Because you know, Morocco is closer to the UK than it is to South Africa and it's still part of Africa. As you can see in the picture that day, I was so ashamed because I'd already been told about the single story and I was already aware about stereotypes about the whole of Africa as a continent, people thinking it's a country. I really get confused, like I do not understand why, like it's 2022 and people still think Africa is a country and not a continent. Like there's Google, there's, like you just need to Google, just go to Google and even figure out how many countries are in Africa. It's not that hard. And we had spoken to the group about it. Me and my brother who's over there, we had spoken to them about it, but they didn't care. The thing I will say is that myself and my brother did not take from the pot. Our expenses were paid for. Um, and my mum spent two years saving and making a lot of sacrifices so we had the money to do that because she wanted to do this the ethical way. My mum was the first person to really criticise the nature of the trip. So let's start talking about the trip itself and the things that shouldn't have happened. What did we actually do on the trip? Well, we visited various different communities and we basically played with the children, talked to them about God, ate with them, we spend around maybe four or five hours in total. And then we go back to our nice lodgings in a place, I believe it was called White River, um, where we were behind an electric fence. And we were really safe and secure and we'd have dinner and just relax. I believe we spent eight days out of the two weeks doing these visits. And then we had one weekday each of the weeks where we would do something else with the charity in their compound, basically praying and talking about the issues that South Africa face. Personally, if you ask me, if you're going on a charity mission, um, you're basically going to give of yourself. I don't understand why you wouldn't stay within the community. You wouldn't stay as the community stays, like experience the day-to-day -day lives of the community. Why are we leaving the community and going to stay in fancy hotels, fancy A and Bs? Is that even part of that experience? I don't understand, please. Someone explain. For me, that has always been an issue. What exactly was this helping the kids? So charity, which will not be named for now, used to always say, give a man to fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for his life. We were meant to be teaching people to fish. I don't think, I also don't agree with this part. I don't think African people need to be taught anything. We have survived for, we have survived for millions of years on our own. Before we were colonized, we lived happily ever after. We were fending for ourselves. We were self-taught. We knew how to hunt. We knew how to prepare our food. I don't think we need to be taught anything. So I actually don't agree with this part. You know, I don't mind that you're coming to Africa to share the gospel. I do not mind that. But I don't believe that we need to be taught anything. I do not believe in that. I'm sorry. I failed to see how knowledge of God, which they already had, by the way, could have helped at all to improve their communities. We were led to believe that these people rarely got any visitors, but it transpired that there were actually groups every two weeks who would go and visit the same communities. When we tried to take selfies with the kids, they started posing like this, because they'd had selfies taken with them so many times. They were unimpressed by our smartphones and our modern technology. So essentially what we were doing was going, playing dame, games, taking pictures as if it was a human zoo, and then writing a blog about how God loves all of us. This is the most problematic part ever like just going to the communities randomly taking pictures of the community and especially children taking pictures of somebody else's child without their permission and going to post them online or sometimes even in publications you know and usually the way these images are taken they are supposed to depict a child who's never had a meal in i don't know how many days and if you find out the background of that child chances are 
that's not true. So this is really problematic and this is always a red flag for me. Us and how lucky we are. They perceive this as an innocent picture of me playing with a child, but this is actually poverty porn. We were sometimes encouraged to interact with the children for the sole purpose of getting photos like this. These were then published on our daily blog so that the leaders could talk about what a great thing we were doing and how selfless we were and how we were spreading God's love and changing the world for the better, one AIDS orphan at a time. This is part three of my story. My brother felt very uncomfortable in front of the camera and he felt very uncomfortable interacting with the kids because he kind of clicked onto that it wasn't really right. A few days into the trip, one of the leaders asked him to pose with some pots and pans and pretend to be cleaning them because some members of the church community had noticed there weren't many pictures of him on the blog because he was avoiding being photographed since he didn't feel comfortable with us being involved in this kind of poverty porn. Of this picture. So as I mentioned before, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, feed him for his life. So we weren't allowed to give any gifts because otherwise visitors who came after us would be expected to give the same apparently. So this was one of the lovely pictures of poverty porn on the blog so people in the UK could see what a good job we were doing. And as I said before, that toy was snatched off that girl right after the photo was taken. Now, many of our team members have done multiple trips back to South Africa or other parts of the continent since. And one of them happens to be a midwife. Um, she posts pictures of the children on her Instagram. But one time she posted a picture of her friend's baby after giving birth and she put permission given by the parents. Never have I seen in any of the pictures from South Africa that permission was given by the parents of those children. To me, that's a massive double standard because she clearly understands consent when it comes to her friend's children, but not when it comes to these AIDS orphans in sub-Saharan Africa, apparently. As I mentioned before, my brother was very critical during the trip. I wasn't so vocal. I did say things, but I didn't ever hold my guns and, and stick to it. The leaders bullied him. And in part four, I'm going to go into more detail on what happened a picture of me and a baby. Now let me give you a bit of context. They were not one of the AIDS orphans we'd come there to help, but rather a random child. We were at the family's house. They let me hold them. And before they'd even sat down on my lap, the paps had already started capturing pictures of us. Later one of the pictures was used in our blog. This is just a random baby that happens to be a POC. Of course, people back home, this was me doing my bit to help the AIDS orphans of sub-Saharan Africa. Just Let's reverse the roles and see what's wrong with this. Imagine a group of Nigerian tourists came into a British person's back garden asked to hold their baby and then started taking pictures with them. That would seem a bit weird, wouldn't it? Well, this was weird too. We'll talk about the lies. This is a care point in one of the communities called Sirtuka, and I believe it's here where the toilet incident happened. For context, we went to a Deanery Project meeting in St Albans. This is basically where you talk about your cause and they decide if they want to give you some money to support it. We were successful in securing £2,000, but it had to be spent specifically on work in the community. And to our credit, we were not going to go build new infrastructure because we were well aware of some of the disasters that have happened because white people have turned up in African countries with no experience in construction, started building a school, finished it, and then there's been a natural disaster and people have unfortunately lost their life. This is just another part of the white saviour complex, going out with no experience and suddenly being an expert in something, whether it's building or whether it's medicine or something else. The audacity. So anyway, we asked the charity if the money could go on infrastructure and they said unfortunately it would just go in the pot and probably be spent on food stock. I believe it was in Sivtuka where we discovered there'd been a brand new toilet built at the care point. That evening, leaders spoke to us and said they were going to speak to the charity and ask if a plaque could be put to say that that is what the Deanery Project's money was spent on. Myself, my brother and one of the members of the party objected to this. We said it was unethical because that's not what the money was spent on. The toilet was built before we came there, before the charity received our money. We were 18 and 17 respectively. But the Fulig adults laughed it off and said it was perfectly fine. That we lied to the church that their money went to build that toilet, when really, we don't know what that money went on. And of course, this extra money from the Deanery Project was a good distraction to cover up the fact that so much money had been spent on flights. Now onto the billing. There was already a bad group dynamic from things that happened in the UK that weren't really relevant towards the trip. And we already felt that the girls on the trip were treated way better than the guys. Um, we were kind of treated like we were stupid, our opinions didn't matter. And we were a lot more critical of the actual trip as a whole, so it's hardly surprising. We were camping out one night, just on the border between South Africa and Swaziland in a town called Ushuk. One of the leaders stepped on my brother's headphones and broke them. They refused to apologise, and this led to him losing his temper and running off. And this moment is now used to discredit our opinions and what happened. I promise I'll get to the bullying in part five. I actually find these type of people insufferable. You're dead on there. The comments are always like, brave, selfless, amazing. And a lot of the time the captions are like, missing this little one. And a lot of the time from my experience, it really is a case of, Hand the baby over, take a photo, pass the baby on. Or, I came here to change your life, but you changed mine. So here's a challenge. The next time you see a white saviour post a picture like this on Facebook, ask them what the child's name is.
It's a picture of my brother and I on the first day of a mission trip. And to be totally honest, in this moment, we were excited. Despite the problems leading up to the trip, we had been surrounded by the community, been told we were doing such a great thing. Of course, it turns out we weren't saving the world. We were simply visiting communities, playing games, talking about God and leaving. Most of the people we met would come to the care point because it was the only place they could get a meal for the day. And of course, we'd use that as an opportunity to talk to them about God. And most of these people already had faith. So it wasn't necessary, but of course, it needed to be reinforced. Essentially, it felt like a way to indoctrinate them. But imagine your audacity to think that your simple presence in a place will change people's lives. Or should I say the caucasity? Am I allowed to say that? I said I'd have really bad feelings, but I kept them to myself. Meanwhile, my brother was a bit more vocal about this. Let's talk about the bullying. Initially, I planned to talk a lot more about this, but my brother and I had a conversation this morning. We decided that this would distract from the point of coming clean and talking about what actually happened and what actually went down. We'd be lying if we didn't admit that the bullying was due to past tensions and not all of that related to the mission trip itself. So during the trip, tensions were building and eventually my brother had a nervous breakdown and the leaders dealt with this essentially by shouting at him all three at once about different things. Two of them were school teachers. They should have known better. One of the care workers alerted the charity who got involved. When members of the charity were around, they spoke to my brother like, we love you, God loves you, we just want to support you and help you overcome this. The moment the charity workers were gone, they were screaming at him again. They wrote an email to my mum talking about his bad behaviour, like at this point he was 18. And then they told us as a group that he wasn't going to be involved in any more activities. Privately, they gave him a letter saying as a group we decided we didn't want him to be involved because people didn't feel feel comfortable with him being involved. But the group never made this decision. Full disclosure, and as I mentioned in my previous video, there was a part where he ran off from the group um, when we were out in a rural area. And because of this, they used as an excuse not to allow him to leave the compound. So we had our cute little late trip on one of the many days off from charitable work, and he wasn't invited. And he also wasn't invited to our barbecue either because, yeah. The reason everything I just said is important is because whenever the efficacy of the trip is brought into question, the issues with my brother are often brought up as a scapegoat, since we're basically the only people criticising this trip. His breakdown, which they interpret as bad behaviour, has since been used in order to silence us. Welcome to the final part of my video, and thank you for making it this far. This is a picture from Kruger National Park. We spent a weekend there. But of course, after the tough work of being missionaries, we deserved it, right? Part six, what happened next? So after the trip had even started, we'd already planned to go and speak at several events after returning to talk about what we'd learned. I attended one of these events in a secondary school. When I got there, I was handed a script of what to say. I believe it had been written before we even departed for our trip. The only speaking I was to do was in a part where they asked us a question. What was the one thing you learned on this trip? What hit you the most? I was told to say this, that I'd learned that I discovered there were things that I just didn't need that I could live without. The most cliched thing. And of course I hadn't. I wish I'd taken that mic and told the truth. I wish I had spoken out about my doubts and about how I thought maybe this trip wasn't so ethical. I have to live with that for the rest of my life that I didn't speak out at that point. Many people are probably wondering why. I was scared, I was intimidated. Unfortunately, the church has a lot of influence in the town and my family at that point were still members. Thankfully now, my family have moved away, which gives me a lot more freedom to speak about this because I know that they will not be harmed. At the time, there was a lot of pressure of me to just follow the script. The worst part was when someone from the church commented to my mum that my part from the presentation made them feel emotional and they were so proud of me. But even then, I was naive and thought that even though we weren't helping people, we weren't necessarily harming them either. Unfortunately, these trips reinforce colonial ideas. You will often find displayed in churches around the UK pictures of poverty porn. Children who have not given their permission. And of course, it's always POC. This encourages people to have a certain idea about the content of Africa. A single story. While I know that the charity did do good in terms of providing infrastructure and food, they made sure that the communities relied on them for these things, so then they could indoctrinate them by talking about God. Having said that, I don't know if naming and shaming them is the right thing, because I'm worried that this will take away what these communities now need. Are these trips ever okay? I don't have experience of every single organisation, just one. But I believe they should be self-funded, and that people should not take pictures. If the charities want to run these trips, they should have a social media ban. Many people from the charity have argued that we need to take pictures and write a blog because it encourages people to relate to the stories and donate to the people. This is their argument. It's curious how they said, teach a man a fish, feed him for a day, give a man a fish, feed him for his life but yet they were essentially making these communities rely on them. Whether they consciously wanted to exploit them or just thought they were doing a good thing, I don't know. For now, I encourage you all to visit No White Saviors and educate yourself on this issue. Finally, I would like to apologise for what we did in 2015. And to the rest of my team, while none of you had bad intentions, none of us had bad intentions, it was wrong. 
So that's the end of the video. I just want to know your thoughts on this video. What do you think? Do you think actually these mission trips can be problematic? Do you think that these mission trips do not add to Africa? I'm really, really keen to hear your thoughts uh, on this video. Leave me a comment in the comment section so that I can know how you feel. What are your thoughts on this video? Without further ado, I will end this video here because it's already long. But uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you turn on your post notification on so you know every time I post, I post a video every single day on this channel. And I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.